up, uh, looking at Northern Renaissance art over the last couple sessions, we've been looking at it as a um, as a, as a, a continuation of Gothic and late medieval ideas. There was no direct break with the past the way it happened in Italy, where they felt they were giving rebirth to a lost a golden era of the ancient Greeks and Romans. Um, uh, and, uh, and, um, and, uh, but in the North, it wasn't true. And we've seen by looking at the Isenheim altarpiece, by looking at Bosch and Bruegel, uh, that there was a lot of uh, late medieval stuff mixing in. Uh, but Durer was, was a real transmitter. And he was not only a transmitter of Italian uh, uh, knowledge and art secrets to the North, but he was also um, he was also himself a major uh, theorist and scientist, and this is why he's sometimes referred to as the Leonardo of the North. So let's take a look at this uh, interesting uh, artist. First of all, remember that there is really no Germany. There's a loose confederation of Germanic states that's called the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and it's uh, a confederation of semi-independent states, 33 or, or actually more than that, including you know, Prussia and Austria and so forth. And you see that it encompasses what is now Austria and Switzerland, as well as uh, the northern part of Italy. Uh, and Nuremberg was the nominal capital of this empire, uh, uh, ruled by this Holy Roman Emperor, sort of because actually there was a great deal of independence between these different German states that were only uh, uh, loosely organized in this manner. Um, so uh, what we, uh, uh, Durer works for the emperor. He's the court artist uh, when he arrives uh, at, in his early thirties. And he's, you know, he's basically at Nuremberg there. He does make a couple trips to Italy, especially Venice, which he loves. And later, uh, he also goes to Antwerp so that he gets to see what's going on in the Flemish uh, lands. Um, so he's an interesting character. Now, he's also a child prodigy. This is a self-portrait that he does in silver point, which is a very unforgiving, difficult medium, where instead of graphite in a pencil, it's silver. Uh, it is, you can't erase it. I've never actually worked with it, but it's, uh, and you can get very, very fine point. It's a very unforgiving medium. I can draw, but I need an eraser. And I, need, and I need, you know, but Durer had that sort of graphic ability, even at the age of 13. And it's not just an accurate portrait, but it really has a certain level of psychological depth. And he doesn't get into a pomposity as he does uh, later on. And this, these uh, emphases on the graphic uh, and drawing aspects of art are really what Durer uh, excels at, as well as printmaking, which is related to these graphic kind of needs. Now let's just take a, a, a beautiful watercolor and ink uh, a piece from uh, uh, 1505. It says right there above his monograph. If I can get my arrow going, Albrecht Durer. This is, you can tell, because this is monograph, is this A kind of shielding a D underneath. And this is 1505. So he's uh, you know, around 30 at this time. So fully mature work. But I wanted to bring it in because it's very small. And I wanted to just show you the level of detail that goes on in a drawing like this. Now, obviously Durer used a magnifying glass and he must, I don't know how he got the rabbit to sit still long enough uh, for him. But it's, 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 uh, it's truly amazing where almost every hair is individually rendered. This is not large. I've blown this way up beyond the size. It's the size of a rabbit. The, the sheet is the size of a little bigger than a, a sheet of typewriter paper. Um, but this exquisite, uh, incredibly detailed, realistic rendering in a very, very graphic, very linear sort of style is what Durer is known for and the kind of heritage that he passes on to later Northern artists. Just to give you an idea of his relentless realism and his uncompromising willingness to look at things uh, as they are instead of idealizing them is this picture that he does quite a bit later, I admit. I guess he's probably in his 40s by this time, but this is his mother and talk about an unsentimental, uh, almost brutal representation 
of this woman who and he captures her psychological uh, disposition as well. She's very elderly here. Uh, but this I brought in to show you this relentless uh, realism that he's noted for. Now, this is uh, the only drawing we have of his wife. It was an arranged marriage. His father was a goldsmith. And so that's where he began to learn how to engrave and how to work on this graphic manner. Um, uh, uh, and he was an arranged marriage to a, a well-to-do um, uh, businessman's uh, daughter. And this is a little sketch that he makes of her. And I think it's the only representation of her that we have. Uh, just to show you how, you know, sort of uh, unsentimental this uh, arranged marriage was. Uh, uh, they never had any children. Uh, but also a month after marrying, he decides to go to Italy and stays for over a year in Italy as a young man, leaving his wife, you know, well provided for because Durer, even at this early age, was, uh, was a successful uh, artist and was getting commissions. But here you can see this wonderful, again, this graphic quality and the psychological depth that I think he brings to his portraiture when he decides to do that. Now, as he traveled, uh, you know, uh, to Italy, he of course had to cross the Alps. Uh, there weren't uh, trains that were uh, the way there are nowadays. So it's really a, a, an arduous a journey. And he does make these little watercolor sketches as he goes along. Uh, he's fascinated by these this sort of uh, alpine uh, landscapes, the breathtaking beauty of it, the little uh, castles and, and even remnants of castles that are along the Rhine or along the Danube uh, that he was uh, familiar with. And, and so he was very, and so he does make his contribution to uh, landscape painting, which I mentioned before was very distinctive a characteristic of this Northern Renaissance art uh, and fairly realistic uh, uh, landscapes, uh, especially compared to Italy, where it's just sort of enough of a thing that you know it's on the earth, uh, right? But here, and there's an expressive quality. Here, this little pond that he paints in watercolors, these are all very small. You see there are some burned out trees on the left that, uh, you know, are evidence of a recent uh, fire. Again, he doesn't gussy it up and he shows the dead trees along with the evergreens. There might've been some sort of reference to life and death, I don't know, uh, but he's, uh, he's picking up in the landscape and doing pure landscapes. There's really no figures in here. Uh, although he really never intended to sell these or anything, they're indicative of a landscape uh, orientation. Also this beautiful thing, and this was made during his first trip, Again, it's ink and watercolor. It's very small, very small, seven by five, something like that. It's just this little tuft of grass. And that's what it's called, it's tuft of grass. And it is so exact that botanists can identify every species that he shows. That's how realistic it is. So he just dug up this little piece of turf, uh, you know, a, a little bit of dirt with, uh, we can see dandelions and I see other, a sort of species there, and then does this incredibly investigative, scientific sort of um, a representation of it. Um, and so he's, he establishes himself as this veristic uh, realist of uh, considerable uh, uh, powers. While he's in Italy, he loves Italy. He makes a lot of connections. He's a very, uh, he's a schmoozer, you know, a durer, and uh, he speaks Italian. So he's able to stay there and, and he loves Italian art. He loves especially uh, Venice and he loves the great uh, uh, painters of Venice, uh, Titian, uh, uh, who's uh, roughly his uh, age and uh, Tintoretto, Giorgione uh, and Bellini, who he has the highest uh, regard for. And Bellini uh, is still alive and he looks at those radiant uh, colors of them, of the Venetians, yet he remains very, very different because his is such a linear style. He's really conceiving of things in terms of line, not in terms of light and masses of color like the Venetian Renaissance artist did. This is a great portrait of him when he returns from Italy, uh, incredibly dandified uh, uh, with this uh, beautiful uh, hair that must have taken uh, an hour uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, preparing with uh, and the uh, foppish kind of hat. He shows himself as a completely worldly 
a man uh, with great self-confidence and looks directly at the viewer. Again, he doesn't idealize his, his uh, rather homely uh, features, uh, but uh, shows himself uh, as certainly assuming the role of a gentleman, of an intellectual, of a scholar, not to be confused with a mere craftsman, because the same sort of uh, change in status from being a craftsman on the level of a baker or a, um, a um, shoemaker, for example, uh, respectable professions, but not upper class. He de de definitely adhered to the Italian idea of the artist as a genius touched by God. Um, and uh, he reflects this in some of his uh, portraits. He also writes and publishes, because now remember, Gutenberg uh, has been around for 50 years and uh, he's movable type and the presence now of paper. Paper was a, a, a thing that came into Europe only during the Renaissance. It was invented by the Chinese in the like fifth or sixth century. And it had worked its way slowly across Asia through the Muslim uh, lands and then finally appearing in, um, in uh, Italy. And it much, much cheaper than the lambskin, you know, that they used to have to use the parchment. And then the movable type uh, combined with the affordability and the cheapness of paper made for a very uh, volatile uh, uh, intellectual scene where there was a lot of exchange of information. Now in this one, uh, Durer, it's part of an essay on, um, on perspective which uh, you know, they had guessed at in the North, but he now uh, completely realized after going to Italy. And he shows us here this diagram of an artist using a sighting device and using what's called the graticulate net, which uh, Vasari talks about. And I actually have one here. I don't know if you can see it. It's, um, um, it's used for enlarging things. So if you have, you lay this over something and then you, uh, or you use it like this, you know, uh, as a template between you and the subject. And here, for example, this, uh, this very foreshortened view of the nude is very, very, very difficult. Not the view that we see from the side, but the view that the depicted artist sees. It's very difficult to do that, that foreshortened thing. And yet this graticulate net helps him because as you see his paper has the same squares as what he sees uh, through the graticulate net. And he uses that sighting device because every time you shift your perspective, you sh shift your position, you shift the perspective. So, uh, so this is a useful device and it's been talked about, uh, but now Durer actually draws it out so that you can make one for yourself. Um, and this was very much a part of his educational efforts. Durer had a great deal of influence as a theorist and as a printmaker, uh, more than as a painter, although he's thought of more kind of as a painter by us today. His first really, really successful printing series uh, was the, uh, the illustrations to the last book of the New Testament, the Apocalypse. Uh, which uh, Protestants call the Book of Revelation. And if you've ever read this, it's an incredibly trippy uh, LSD type sort of visions of strange uh, uh, happenings and strange monsters and so forth. And it's supposed to be um, predictions of the end of time. And, um, and so uh, it makes a very fertile uh, ground for Durer's kind of Gothic imagination. Remember Bruegel and, and Bosch in his background. Here's one of, for example, uh, and this is a series of woodcuts and they're fairly large. And this is the Whore of Babylon, uh, drunk on the blood of the martyrs. Let me zoom in for some details. In the lower left, we have a prince of this earth and you can see he has a turban. So it might even be related to the Turks. Uh, as a, you know, evil empire sort of. And then he seems to be presenting, you know, he puts out his hand, we see his back, but you can see he's bejeweled and everything like that. He, uh, he uh, gestures toward this beast, uh, which uh, is ridden by the whore of Babylon. Babylon, um, um, for the writer of this book, 
uh, are all the evil things in the world. And, and most biblical scholars now think it's a reference to Rome and to uh, Nero and so forth. Anyway, the prince of this world uh, introduces the whore of Babylon to these uh, gentlemen uh, and ladies who are you know, upper class, uh, uh, well-dressed contemporary people. So it's not set in biblical times, he sets it in our own times as if this, this strange hallucination is happening in front of us and in front of our neighbors. We identify with it because of the contemporaneous um, a use of contemporaneous uh, fashion. It's the same kind of thing that I remember in the 60s, there were a lot of uh, versions of like Shakespeare in modern dress. It's that kind of thing, gives it an immediacy and makes it seem like it's not just from long ago, but has a, a, re um, a relevance to uh, you today. And there's the horror of Babylon. You can see she's very intoxicated. She's lifting this uh, thing, which is the blood of the martyrs who were sacrificed under, I suppose, Nero uh, in uh, 66 uh, AD. And behind her is a burning uh, city. Uh, uh, if we look above in heaven, the heavenly hosts, the uh, angels are opening up the sky and out comes the martyrs and the saints and the prophets and all the good people in heaven. And they're going to engage in this warfare with the prince of this world and with the whore of Babylon, all right? Uh, so it's a very exciting and very strange uh, kind of thing. And you can see why this captured people's imagination. And remember, it is kind of apocalyptic times with the Reformation, with the, uh, with the recently passing of the uh, plague um, that many people like in our own time are convinced that they're living in the end of time. Here is another uh, of the woodcuts from this, from this uh, series on the Book of the Apocalypse. And here is St. Michael, who's uh, the head of the angelic hosts uh, in doing battle with the devil and uh, depicted as a dragon and a serpent and all these sort of horrible things. So the heavenly hosts are here doing uh, battle with the forces of evil. So it's a fight to the death between good and evil, uh, but in which um, uh, although evil seems to initially win, in the end, um, in the end, uh, in the end comes the end of time and uh, the world is redeemed. Uh, one of the most famous of this series is the four horsemen of the apocalypse. One of the visions is that the seals were opened and these, these, these are fantastic riders over the sky, pestilence, war, death, and so forth, and they come uh, armed. And as you can see, they're, uh, they're um, you know, riding roughshod over uh, peasants and, and including, you know, like down here, a king with a crown, a bishop with his uh, hat on. Uh, uh, so these uh, pestilences, these uh, horrible happenings at the end of time do not discriminate between, you know, bishops and kings and every, everyone is kind of leveled uh, by these horrible uh, things that are coming through. And I think the message is uh, hang in there. I mean, in the book is that even though things are, are bad now and we're persecuted, eventually the cause of right will, uh, will, uh, uh, will, will win in the end. Okay, I wanna also look at the woodcut process. These uh, are called woodcuts. And they're called woodcuts because they're a type of print. And this is not a very good woodcut, but I found it on the internet and I think it shows exactly what it is. You have a piece of wood usually cut from across the grain so that you're not dealing with splinters and you get a slice of wood and, um, you know, and then you, uh, everything you gouge out of the wood will look white. And everything that you remain on the plane of the wood uh, will print so that you gouge out what you want to be white and you leave in everything you want to be black. And then of course you get a reversed image when you print it. And I just couldn't find anything clearer. I'm not meaning this is a great work of art, but it, it shows I think clearly the process. Well, here you can see the incredible level of technical proficiency that Durer brings to the woodcut process. When you consider that each of these white areas, for example, this, um, 
this line here, right? That uh, parallel lines that make shading. These were the thin parts of the wood that were left flat. Everything white had been gouged out of the wood before the, um, the, the, uh, the print was inked up. Um, and so you can see what incredible mastery he has with wood. And you know, you can't really mess up because once you gouge something out, it's gonna look white. So look at the intricacy of this kind of, you know, I mean, he brought it to a whole, a whole new level that goes beyond the mere expressive and hallucinogenic kind of power of the image itself are these, um, you know, these. Now, just to give you an example, here's a woodcut of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse from uh, 1485, right? And so colored woodcut, hand colored. But, you know, this is 15, 20 years later. So Durer really, you know, is a technical virtuoso. And moreover, these things can be sold relatively cheaply because you can get a thousand or so uh, prints, if you're careful, out of a wood block be before it begins to deteriorate, right? And so, um, <clears throat> and so he does limited editions of them, but yet they're uh, relatively inexpensive. So you could buy the whole portfolio of prints of the illustrations and also the words to it, right, in Latin. Uh, uh, to the uh, from, from the Bible. So it was kind of a deluxe edition that you could collect. And this was Durer's great legacy to Europe that we often don't realize is that, you know, to see the Last Supper, you had to go to Milan. To see a Durer, these were circulating throughout Europe. Um, and so a lot of the ideas of the Italian Renaissance found their ultimate form in Durer's widespread uh, dissemination of prints. And most people in places like England, places like you know, uh, Spain, that's how they kind of learned uh, about the Renaissance, not directly through Michelangelo and Raphael and those guys. And we often forget that because Durer had a more important influence on the following generation than any of the Italians, uh, and it's because of his prints and uh, and and his decimate, uh, de decimate, his dissemination of them. Now he also does, uh, uh, and he does several series of prints, but he also does engravings. And when I brought this in, it's Adam and Eve, of course, uh, uh, and uh, they are very very Italian types. You can tell he's been to Italy. <clears throat> the proportions, <clears throat> the muscularity of the man, the, um, the postures even of them are derived from the Medici Venus and from the Apollo Belvedere. So he's been looking at classical sculpture and he's been looking at how this classical sculpture has been treated by Italian artists like uh, Raphael and Titian. And in fact, it's interesting because they look so Italian Yet the Garden of Eden is so German. It looks like, you know, the Teutonberg forest uh, uh, with this cliff with a, a goat up here is interesting. And so you see the, the, um, the, the um, parrot represents knowledge. The way we think of an owl as wise, uh, they thought of owls as evil, devil, but they thought of a parrot because they can talk that they were somehow wise. And so the parrot is on a branch uh, that Adam holds in his hand. And this represents the tree of life, I guess the tree to the left. And, and they could eat of the fruit of the tree of life and they'd stay alive forever. However, the tree that was forbidden was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so uh, the serpent is there uh, giving an apple uh, to Eve and she's just accepting it. Uh, Adam is a little concerned. He's not sure he wants to go along with this, uh, but Eve will prevail in the end. It's interesting from a botan, you know, from a botany standpoint that even though the serpent hands Eve an apple, the leaves on the apple tree are fig, like a fig tree. Uh, and this refers to the fig leaves that they've already seemed to have woven for themselves after, the, after they fall after they eat of the forbidden fruit, he shows them now. So he's 
he's inventing this new kind of uh, tree uh, out of it. And it's interesting how they're kind of in this forest. They always look to me like they got confused and they wa wandered out of one of Raphael's paintings into the Teutonberg forest and uh, there was uh, captured by, uh, by Durer. Um, uh, uh, it's beautiful. I wanted to also note, you know, for the process of this engraving is, and the, here again is not a great work of art. I got it off the internet, but I think it serves the purposes of understanding what engraving is. You have a copper plate, could be engraving and other things, but copper is the typical thing because it's soft. And you get a graver, this little tool, and you, everything that you engrave in it will be a black line. So it's the opposite of a woodcut. In a woodcut, you're cutting away the white and what's left is black. In the um, in engraving, you incise the lines that will be filled with ink. Because what you do is after you've engraved this like this, you ink up the surface of it and then you take a rag and you wipe the surface clean, leaving ink in the grooves. And then you, the, the pressure of the press will imprint the, um, the uh, intaglio ink that lies beneath the surface. You're always wiping with a rag, you know, ink, wipe, print. Um, and, uh, and engravings, you know, with a woodcut, you can make maybe a thousand. With engravings, you can make many more than that. So they're, although they're more time consuming, I suppose, to make, uh, when you finally get them, you can really mass produce them if you have a good uh, printing uh, system. What I wanted to show you here is that how you arrive at grays are through uh, uh, lines that are parallel. And you can see that here, for example, on the shadow that falls on Adam's leg, as you can see, there are individual lines. Sometimes too is cross hatching, not only using parallel lines like in this tree, but then going the opposite direction, like here to create these darknesses of the woods uh, behind. And here, of course, the cat is about to pounce on the mouse because all these forces of evil and predatory uh, and death are introduced uh, by uh, the uh, eating of the forbidden uh, fruit. I want to point out too, well, look, and this is, uh, shows you how different it is from these earlier Northern kind of conceptions of uh, Adam and Eve. These are two wings from the Ghent altarpiece by Jan van Eyck from about 1430. So they're, you know, they're, they're 70 years uh, before, but the, the uh, idealization of form is much closer to Raphael and Leonardo and the ancient Greeks and Romans in uh, the Durer than it is in the more realistic kind of homely uh, but believable uh, Adam and Eve of the earlier Northern artists. I wanted to also point out an interesting thing is that as far as um, you know, uh, psychology of the time, one of the ways they explained um, human disposition and personality uh, was that there were these humors, um, um, uh, liquids in the body, phlegm from the, from the lungs, uh, blood, um, and uh, black bile from the liver and yellow bile, they, they, you know. And these were, uh, were uh, coordinated with uh, personality types, these four major types. And so uh, let's see if I can remember these. The melancholic, uh, the uh, black bile, that's represented by the stag, who's very reduced in size, by the way, uh, compared to the Adam and Eve, uh, because he needs to fit these in. Uh, so by eating the apple, they've, re they've uh, released these, uh, these humors. So melancholy can lead to depression. It can lead to suicidal thoughts, it's all these sort of things. So it's a danger. Uh, uh, and and <clears throat> Durer kind of felt that the artist is a melancholic type. But the other types here is phlegmatic phlegm, um, which is, um, which is uh, has to do with laziness and with uh, sloth and uh, overeating and those kind of things. And so that's represented by the ox, which is just kind of lethargic. And then the, uh, the, the cat is, I forget what they call it, but it's, um, 
it's the uh, quick tempered uh, yellow bile that springs into action like that. And so uh, that uh, volatile kind of uh, explosive uh, personality is the cat. And the cat is about to uh, kill the mouse. As soon as Adam eats of the apple, all these uh, evils uh, are released into the world. And finally, the rabbit. And the rabbit represents the sang sanguine uh, or blood. And the sanguine people are very, very happy. They like to eat, they're lustful. They, um, and so this represents, uh, each of them has sort of a, a normal range. And then they sort of, uh, there's a spectrum that kind of ex you know, goes over to where it's vice, where it's sin. So all these things were seen as temptations. This is kind of interesting, is that this was the psychology of the time. Remember, they did not know, for example, that the heart was a pump. They thought the heart was the seat of emotions. Even Leonardo, who takes apart hearts and draws them, didn't understand the function of it as a pump. Um, so medicine at this time, including psychology, but it's interesting that they have a concept of psychology at all and helps them kind of explain uh, differences in people's dispositions and moods and so forth. I think it's interesting. He does a, a particular, and I should have brought it in, I suppose, called the melancholy because he felt himself born under the sign of Saturn to be the artist's uh, kind of destiny is that he, you know, uh, incarnates this genius of God but then he sees the imperfection all around him. And so is led into a melancholic sort of disposition. It's interesting and it prefigures our ideas of the sort of misunderstood, tortured artist. Uh, it, it really begins with, uh, with uh, these sorts of ideas and these sort of explanations uh, for it. Because at the same time the artist is in contact with God, you know, by being a genius. He's also um, in contact with all the lusts and all the, all the bad things that go along uh, with, and the vices and so forth. And so, um, so it, it reveals still a kind of medieval uh, uh, idea of reality. Another one of the, um, of the uh, he does uh, several series of prints. They were very, very lucrative for him. He also does portraits. He's the court artist of the emperor in Nuremberg and has a very impressive house right in the shadow of the palace uh, of, the, of the emperor. He does another series, and this is, I'll show you a couple of them. And these are, I believe, woodcuts as well. And they're from the life of Mary. And so here's Mary with uh, her uh, infant. Joseph is shown very old to show that he has nothing to do with this uh, birth except as a, as a sort of a foster father or a caretaker. Mary is a lovely uh, young uh, woman. Above is God and the Holy Ghost kind of coming down on them. And in the background is this wonderful uh, landscape, a little hamlet on the left, uh, looks like a farm uh, and uh, goes back into the distance with this alpine uh, landscape. Um, it's a, an entirely uh, beautiful and fresh and lovely uh, conception. Um, and here's on one of my favorites is this wonderful uh, visitation of the shepherds. You can see the star of Bethlehem is up there. And it's interesting how Durer situates himself below so that he's sort of looking up. Notice the planks here that we see the bottom of the straw. So they're sort of, uh, I guess, in sort of the hayloft almost of a barn. Um, and, um, and, uh, and you can see this. And I see that they have, um, that it's been reversed. Somehow, when I picked it up, it's you can see the Albrecht Durer is reversed. I'm sorry about that. It should really be the opposite way. I don't know how that occurred. Uh, so this graphic sense, the sense of printmaking, of drawing, of line, as being the supreme sort of element of graphic design and design, you know, rather than color. And where we see it, um, uh, very interesting, uh, are these partially finished paintings. And this is a painting from Durer's workshop that was never finished and came down to us in this unfinished state. And it's interesting because we get to see the technique that he used uh, when it's partially done. And as you can see, there's a very clear drawing underneath. It looks like pencil or silver point um, and uh, with cross hatching and everything as if it's a print. You can see that in the hands as well. There's just that background color Endura probably uh, tinted the whole thing, this kind of cream, 
this yellowish uh, color. We see it there. We see it in the shadows here in this uh, globe that represents the universe. You know, uh, God is, I mean, Jesus is supposed to be kind of king of the universe. He's, the, you know, and so he holds in his hand, not the world, because they didn't know the world was round, uh, but the universe, you know, top by a cross. But anyway, what I want to show you here is blessing us. But you can see to what extent Durer's paintings are colored drawings. He really works everything out in a linear form before, and then he glazes over the colors almost in, in a kind of a coloring sort of way. And although he gets very rich and very beautiful uh, colors, they don't have that. And this is probably what he loved about Venice was the way that they sort of use color and light without lines, uh, you know? And, and so he brings a very, uh, this very uh, um, uh, linear technique uh, to his uh, paintings. He does a second trip to Venice where he stays two years um, and, uh, and when he's about 30. And this is a self-portrait that he executes around that time when he returned. Again, he is uh, well-to-do. He has a big house. He's the, uh, he's the uh, official artist uh, of the court of the emperor in Nuremberg. Uh, and he's really a man who has fully arrived. And it's interesting, I put this in next to the Salvatore Mundi to show you how much he sort of represents himself as a Christ. And this I don't think should be misinterpreted that he was arrogant so much. Well, I think he probably did have a very high opinion of himself. But this idea that the artist kind of incarnates this Christ spirit that incarnates this genius, this uh, thing from God that allows him the introspection to see the perfect forms as they exist in the mind of God, but are invisible to human uh, uh, eyes. Uh, the artist sees beyond that. And so he's showing himself as sort of a savior that the artist can enlighten people. He can show them how to look. Uh, and the artist is kind of a, an incarnation of Christ, because just as God creates the world out of nothing, um, uh, so uh, uh, the artist sort of draws out of himself and creates a whole illusionary, illusory world. This is his portrait of the Emperor Maximilian, uh, 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 who was his boss. And uh, he holds in his hand a pomegranate that has all these little seeds because he's the prince of all these German states that are like these little seeds inside the pomegranate. Truth of the matter is he didn't really have much power at all. And a lot of it was just popped uh, uh, because these German states were very independent. And one of the signs of how independent, and you gotta give the Nuremberg's credit for this. Okay, so the emperor lives there in Nuremberg and the Nuremberg city council decided that they were gonna adopt Lutheranism as the official, uh, uh, church of the state. And the emperor was a Catholic. So this is uh, an incredible thing. And, you know, I was thinking about it too, is it's not only, you know, courageous to stand up and it showed how, you know, impotent the emperor really was ultimately. But it also represents, I think, an interesting, um, economic um, sacrifice that the people of Nuremberg, which is this grand city, were, uh, were willing to do because they had all these relics, a thorn from the crown of thorns and a drop of blood from the crucifixion and a, a piece of the cross and Mary's tears and all these different sort of things, which the Lutherans didn't believe in, Barbarossa's sword and everything. But instead of destroying them, and this is very interesting. They decided to label them all and keep them as historical things. They had given up the Catholic faith, but they still wanted to keep these relics, not because they believed that they had any magical powers or anything like that, but just because they, rep they were interested in their own history. And this, I think, is uh, one of the early cases of, uh, what do you call it, like uh, historic preservation that you know, it would be easy for them just to destroy all this stuff. Say this is a bunch of a malarkey. There's no true cross. You know, all that sort of stuff. 
And yet uh, they decided to label them and put them away. That's interesting kind of mentality uh, that they had. And Willie, really, because really, that made a lot of money. Tourists would come in to see these relics. They'd stay at the hotel. They'd have you know, dinner at the tavern. So they really, uh, it was an economic sacrifice that was based, I guess, on a true acceptance of Lutheranism as a viable thing. While he was in Venice, he got the second trip, he had a very interesting uh, commission. And that was from, a, a, there was a, a businessman's association of German merchants who uh, were in Venice and they had their own guild hall. I mean, they owned their own confraternity, which is like a men's club. And, uh, but it was also where you made business contacts. And uh, because of his, uh, because he was German and he, you know, yet was on the level of a Venetian master, they hired him to do this magnificent uh, Walter piece, uh, which is now, I, I think, in Prague. Uh, but, um, but it's the Madonna of the Rosenkrantz. And Rosenkrantz is a, a circle of roses or the garland of roses, sometimes called the Madonna of the Garland of Roses. Rosenkranz, a circle of roses, is the name of rosary, you know, the Catholic um, beads that are a Marian devotion. You say, you know, Hail Marys, you say, uh, you know, Catholic things on these beads. And the originator of the beads was St. Dominic. And here he's shown handing out rosaries to people, but also as a Rosenkranz, as a circle of roses. And so Mary, uh, and down here in the foreground are the Pope, and the emperor, Maximilian, and each of them, Mary places a Rosenkranz, a crown of circle of uh, roses on the emperor's uh, head. And uh, Jesus himself places the, the, uh, the garland of roses on the Pope's head. So there's no, um, there's no question about uh, Protestantism in this painting. It doesn't exist in the German realm. Um, and one of the things I think he does here is he wants to rival the colors of the Venetians. And this is one of his, you know, that blue of Mary's robe, the red of the emperor's uh, cape, uh, the frosty alpine uh, landscape in the background, uh, beautiful. But also it has all these uh, 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 geometric uh, configurations that, you know, uh, within the composition. Here's another one. You know, so these kind of uh, structuring elements that make the uh, composition, these are very influenced by the Italians. So I think what he's trying to do is trying to show a German can do this just as well as an Italian. It has that kind of a, a feel to the whole thing. And it's interesting that <clears throat> the sketch he did of the Pope's hands are the famous little wonderful drawing of the uh, praying hands that have become it's interesting, they become so beloved by Protestants, more than Catholics. I think Protestants are likely to have a picture of the praying hands or a plaster statue of it or whatever. Uh, but their little tiny drawing with silver point heightened with white on blue paper, it's in Vienna. Just absolutely lovely uh, and very realistic. Notice that, for example, the thumb has, is dirty and has a hangnail, it's sort of been ripped. Someone ripped his thumb off. And, um, and the other elderly hand. So even here, he's not idealizing them the way an Italian would do. Because what I think he's trying to show is a German can do it just as well, but they're not gonna be slavishly Italian. We're gonna bring this German sort of rationality and this German linearity and, and graphic uh, quality. And I think it's one of his most outstanding uh, paintings. Also, he includes a self-portrait, which he uh, you know, uh, seldom does in his large paintings, back here with his kind of reddish hair. And I'm sorry, these details, I wasn't able to get a very clear detail, but you can see him there. He's holding up a thing and says that, you know, uh, I made this. Uh, in the background, the Alps, <clears throat> his beloved Alps, which of course you don't see from Venice. So the whole thing is kind of a, a statement of what a German can do. Uh, uh, and I love that almost suspicious uh, glance he gives us. However, uh, uh, in the, at the height of his powers, he went to Antwerp. He made a, a, in uh, the Netherlands, where he was able to see the work of Jan van Eyck and, and the different Flemish masters. And, um, and it was while he was in Antwerp that Martin Luther was arrested 
uh, he was and uh, brought to a tribunal, a church tribunal, uh, that um, that uh, condemned him to death. And uh, he writes in his di Dura writes in his uh, diary how how tragic it is. And actually, uh, what happened is that he was rescued. Martin Luther was rescued from prison and then went undercover as Junker Jorg. He, he grew a beard and went undercover until he could consolidate his connections and avoid Rome. Anyway, um, Durer uh, writes very, you know, that this is a man of God and so forth. And it's also often brought up because, of course, he has to keep any sympathies with Luther private because his boss is a Catholic. And in fact, the boss, the emperor, right? But in a painting like this, and this is one of his greatest, one of his last paintings, just called the Four Apostles. That was not his name for it. They look like wings to a larger altarpiece, like there should be a crucifixion or a birth of Jesus, something in the center, but instead they're just a diptych. Uh, and uh, what he shows here are actually not four apostles, uh, uh, but uh, John, and Peter on this side, both of whom were disciples of Jesus. And in this side, however, he shows Paul, who was didn't ever meet Jesus, but had a vision of Jesus uh, after Jesus's death. And then um, the gospel writer, Mark, who's not an apostle at all, but he was a disciple of Peter's. So when you read the gospel of Mark, it's supposed to be Peter's version sort of of it. And so he shows these, these four biggies. Now it's interesting that he, there's a like a, uh, almost a secret code of Protestantism running through this painting. And I got these marvelous, huge reproductions on the internet. Uh, so I can show you some really beautiful details. Here it's interesting, John, who writes the gospel, he's shown as young, right? And Peter was probably the same age, just shown as a doddering old man. He has his keys because that's St. Peter was the first Pope. He was crucified in Rome. And Jesus gives him the keys to the kingdom. You know, you go to death, uh, say you meet St. Peter at the gates, right? So now in the book, John opens it up and he points to, it says, in the beginning was the word at the opening of the prologue to his gospel. And uh, what he's what the message here is teaching the dumb old uh, Catholic uh, doddering old uh, man, this young person, it's the word, it's the Bible. It's not superstitious uh, Catholic stuff, it's the word. And so uh, he sort of, uh, and, and Luther's favorite gospel was the gospel of John. And so it's interesting that he kind of shows them in this uh, position. Now, if we go to the other part, here is Mark. And Mark, who was a disciple of Peter, turns away from Peter toward Paul. And Paul is the main man for Luther, because, Paul, because Luther says, you are fa uh, by faith you are saved, not by works, but by faith. And this is the cornerstone of the Protestant Reformation. And Paul is so suspicious. He has this heavy book. He also holds a sword because he was beheaded. That was how he died. But he looks so suspiciously at us. And I have these incredible close-ups that are much bigger than the painting. And look at, he, he literally paints each pore, each pore. Even look at the little, you know, vein here in his temple and the suspicious look and the reflections of the studio that are in his eye. Now, keep in mind, this is not a, even a fully life-size head. So, uh, you know, this level of detail, his incredible virtuosic realism is, is just, it's, it's incredible. One, I guess, uh, Italian artist asked him, what brush do you use to make the hair? He thought there was a special brush that he had. No, he, each one he went in and painted individually. So it's interesting, there's like this subtext here that, that, you know, that Paul is better than Peter, that the word and the Protestants are more important. One should turn away from Peter and toward Paul, uh, who looks at us with this demanding sort of uh, judgmental thing. Um, and so here he is right under the nose of the emperor, a sympathizer with the uh, Protestants. Now, if you ever go to Nuremberg, and Nuremberg was really destroyed after the war because Nuremberg was the place where the Nazis, that was their big thing. And so, but they rebuilt Nuremberg beautifully. <clears throat> They've rebuilt from the from rubble and they rebuilt the house of Durer. 
and it's right next to the Kaiser's palace. And you can get a, you know, you can go, they'll give you a tour of the palace. They have it in English, right? As in Italian or whatever language you want to. But I really uh, think it's great to see Durer's house because you can see obviously a wealthy artist and you can see where the apprentices slept. You can see, uh, and it's this half timbered house uh, that's been restored and they don't have any original Durer's inside but they do have uh, these sort of things that he would have had in his studio. Um, and so we see uh, these workshops uh, here they've put up. Now, as I say, this partially finished thing, this is by some art historian or, you know, this is a prop kind of in this. This is too expensive. They don't have doors here, but it's a wonderful thing. You really get a feeling for what it was like to be an artist and a very successful, a very wealthy artist. Here's his, his printing press. Uh, because he did his own uh, impression, his own uh, printing there. And of course he was uh, uh, unparalleled as a printmaker. So we have a few minutes left and Durer is great. And he had an, an, an incredible, uh, uh, as I said, influence on the following generations, more even than the Italians, filtering through him. But I wanted to turn to another German artist, Hans Holbein. And Holbein, uh, we don't have time, we're just going to look at one painting. But Holbein's interesting because he immigrates to England and he becomes the court artist of King Henry VIII during the Protestant Reformation in England. And he is a, chiefly a portrait artist. And he does portraits of, all, of all, all the people of that time. They're wonderful. But this one I want to zero in on because these are the French ambassadors. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to, to the English court. And uh, it's filled with these allusions to Protestantism and uh, Catholicism. There's a little crucifix hidden up in here. Uh, the floor is the floor of, the, uh, of Westminster Abbey in London. Uh, we, we can recognize the pattern in the floor. So he set up this thing. It, it up here is kind of the celestial realm of the stars and there's a astrolabe and things down here is the, um, the personal realm. And, and there are allusions to, there's a Lutheran hymnal and, and a, one of the strings of the lute is broken to, you know, because these are Catholics uh, in the court of Henry VIII. Uh, and it's, it's in the National Gallery in London. There's a life size, it's a big painting. But what I wanna alert you to I wish we had more time to look at Holbein. He's worth looking up. And this painting, I wish we had more time. I could go into it, a lot of symbolism. But look at this strange shape. You see that? Isn't that weird? What's that doing down there, right? This weird thing. And this is, if you turn the painting, you see that this long, weird looking abstract shape is actually a skull. And you only see it, it was positioned by a, sta a stairway. So you only see it if you're on an angle like that. And, and it comes into perfect uh, focus as a reminder, as a memento mori, as a reminder of death. So don't get to, too attached to all these physical things because death is waiting there. And why I brought this in is because it's a segue to the next lecture, which will tie up this long series on the Renaissance. And we're gonna look at this very strange phenomenon called mannerism. And mannerism like this has strange stuff in it. And it seems to take the balance and harmony and order of the Renaissance and uh, instead looks at imbalance, distortions of perspective, weird uh, 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 things. And, and El Greco is the kind of supreme artist of this mannerist movement. And I find it fascinating because who would think at the end of all this triumph of idealism comes this kind of strange mannerism and exactly what it means as a coda to, and a kind of a cap to the Renaissance. Okay, so that's what I have on Durer and we can open it up for questions if you'd like to at this point.
Uh, do you want to remove the share? Let me just uh, stop recording first. Yeah, there. Okay.